Over to you, Tim. Awesome. All right. So uh, this is my, I guess this is my doctoral research. Um, I am looking at uh, reconsidering the implications of scale within open education. And I can click my own slides. There you go. Uh, so I'll chat a little bit about myself and then about my study. And um, please do jump in, ask questions, chat, whatever. Uh, you know, we don't have to go in chronological order for sure, especially with a small group. Uh, but I will talk a little bit about myself, some boots and, and my many opens. Uh, this is my kids. So, um, yeah, uh, so this is my five kids. The oldest is almost 21 and the youngest is almost 13. Uh, and so that, you know, mostly pretty much everything I do, my, 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 my story with open, why, why, why I've been involved with, uh, open and distance education for 25 years has a lot to do with these five. So, um, they're always sort of at the center of everything I do. Uh, and then um, this is some pictures of some boots. So a few years ago now, I guess, um, you know, I was thinking about open education, MOOCs, OERs, educational technology, data, privacy, all these things. Um, and then I started thinking about boots and, and I used to live in the Northwest Territories and I would sew with my, um, with my mother-in-law. And the boots at the top are a pair of gummocks that I, that, that she taught me how to sew and I sewed. And I thought about the difference between those and those you know, commercial boots at the bottom. And anybody who lives in Canada wears a pair of boots in the, like the ones in the bottom. Um, and I thought about the difference in terms of material choices, in terms of um, effort, in terms of repairing them versus throwing them out, commercially made versus made for you know, individual human. Um, when we first made the top ones, they fell down. So we added laces, like there was experimentation, um, but there was also maintenance to them. Like it, you know, wh when they break, you re -sew them, you don't throw them out. And so I thought about that and I thought about how we use and our expectations around um, educational technology and that we have these expectations for it to magically work for it to scale limitless, limitlessly. Um, and really, this is start. You know, I always come back to the to these to these gummicks and and thinking how do we start to think differently about how we do open education, or what would be the values of thinking? What would be the benefits of thinking differently about how we do open education? Um, and then I've mentioned before about my many opens. So I mean, you know, I've been taking open education course or distance education courses for I started about twenty five years ago. Um, when I started, I was living in the north. I, you know, I'm fond of course in a box, <laughs> course in a box with a you know telephone tutor. Um, you know, since then, obviously, it's gone through a lot, right? I feel like there's been learning objects, OER, uh, MOOCs. You know, now we're seeing OEP. Now, you know, now social justice. Like it's been this ongoing, you know, open software. You know, it, you know, it just it's it's been this constant transition. Um, and constant sort of buzz, ebb and flow, and buzz and excitement. Um, and for me, underneath it all is oh, it's always been about access, um, and and not necessarily the buzz and the you know. I think there's been a lot. I think about all the harm that's been done by some of these, some of the scale pieces, um, or um, and the hype and the and the funding that's connected to that. Um, so my study. Uh, so if I was going to situate my research, um, I think this was, I saw this, I actually saw this in Twitter and went looking for it. I think they shared this yesterday at OE Global. Sometimes I struggle to situate my research because it's so not practical. Um, and then people say it's not theoretical because I don't make you know theoretical frameworks. And so when I saw this, it actually really resonated because I said, oh, yeah, that's where I am. I'm way down there at the bottom of the iceberg. You know, I'm really thinking about the philosophical foundations. Um, you know, what do we believe to be true and how does that impact all the steps up the chain? So for the first time ever, I feel like I can situate my research within open educational research. So thank you so much for that particular image. <laughs> 
Um, so when I think about scale, I think a lot about big and small. So, you know, big approaches to open education tend to be formed and form specific relationships between knowledge, power, and authority. Um, Cory Doctorow has, and actually, since I wrote this, this idea of big tech has actually become really big. Um, <laughs> when I started doing this three or four years ago, people weren't talking openly about this idea of big tech. Um, so some of this, I have to actually go back and re, re, I don't know if I have to rewrite it, but I have to sort of rethink it because these ideas really weren't bubbling out. And so what I really would like to encourage us to do though, is think more about what, what's big open education and, and rethinking um, some of the risks of, of big open education. Um, so I guess I'll be quiet for a second. What, like, are there examples? What, what examples do you guys have when I say large scale or big open education? Are there things that jump out to you guys? You can put them in the chat or just talk or whatever. MIT courseware. <laughs> So, yeah, absolutely. All, yeah. You know, all the all the coursewares for sure. Yeah, yeah. MOOCs, open textbooks. Yeah. Uh, the Open University. Yep. You know, I yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, open access publishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Others. I'd say even GitHub, to a certain extent. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube. Twitter, <laughs> some of the open source pieces for sure. So yeah, absolutely. You know, open is a uh, big is a lot of things, um, and I think big is also contextual, right? Big if we're talking about a social media network might be different than big if we're talking about, um, uh, you know, a, a classroom or a whatever a cohort or something like that. Um, and so on the flip side is the possibilities of small. And so this is where I've really been thinking about what does a smaller scale approach to open education look like? And how might learners learn, you know, actually it was Martin talked about like a pedagogy of, of abundance. And, and for me, thinking about small and appreciating small might be an answer to how do we teach people to deal with abundance? It's not about more and, and finding more and having more, it's about, knowing when enough is enough and 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 appreciating the small in a world of abundance um and 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 learning to really negotiate those tensions and um i, I you know uh we've never really had to deal with abundance in the way we have it now um because there's been there were really limits right there was limits to classrooms there were limits to buildings limit to travel we've got the limit to travel back but this this even with the limit to travel now, it doesn't stop, right? This stuff keeps coming at us. So how do we teach people how to be okay with enough? How do we get rid of the question, does it scale? Like if there's one question on my list of things I'd never want to hear again, it's, but does it scale? <laughs> yeah, and Dave's do it. Yeah, I know Dave's working on uh, pedagogy of abundance. So absolutely, I'll look into that for sure. So what are some examples of small scale open education that you guys think about? Yeah, individual courses. Sarah, you'll be talking awesome, small stuff, good. Yeah, creating your own resources. Open pedagogy is often small. Uh, DIY podcast videos, absolutely. Th those are the small ones, um, for sure. And so, at the at the core of this all, I really believe that small can be powerful. Um, this is I was. This was just before my candidacy presentation. Um, the fence outside the White House, and you know, I thought about this as. What about if we think of each of those signs as like an O, as an OER, right? Each of those, like 846 as an open educational research. And, and the power in each of those put together um, and like the low techness of it. So going back to the idea of, you know, sewing as being low tech, 
you know, pens and paper, right? And, and the power and the giving and sharing, um, you know, that idea of it being small, messy, simple, and really wonderful and powerful that it, you know, so much came out of this that doesn't come out of some of those big initiatives, right? This was, this is, this is driven by people working together in a very small way. Uh, I'm just reading what Rob wrote here. Uh, yeah, some of it's about definitely, I think there's something about how it's used for sure. Um, yeah, I think that that's part of it. I think it's also the resource size itself, or at least that's what I'm thinking about, right? Like in different kinds of resources um, for different purposes. Like a textbook is different than, um, than a small blog post, that kind of thing. So my research is qualitative, tentative, and critical. Um, you know, it's, I, I think about it as, as an unveiling, um, you know, pulling back, accepting the, the, the wild wrongness. So, you know, I, I, in my opinion, there's a lack of criticality. There's, there's a lack of ability to accept criticality in the field of open education. Um, you know, I mean, in all areas, people take research really personally, but I, I think this idea of it, what if we have been wrong all these years has is a really challenging question within the field of open. Like it's, and I think this has to do with how it's funded. I, I think there's a lot to that that we have to think about. Um, and then the second quote here is, you know, I believe this. This came out of actually a fiction book where I think I find most of my <laughs> most of what really resonates with me right now. But it's, I think we keep repeating the same mistakes. Maybe we should mistrust ideas that we think are original in ours alone. And and if there's one sentence that I think, you know, COVID and what we've been through that I think we really need to think about in terms of the fields of open and distance education, it would be that sentence. Like, why is it that we keep doing the same things and making the same mistakes over and over again? Um, so my research approach is situational analysis. So it involves these maps. So a situational map, this messy one at the bottom and then creating um, positional and world arena maps going forward. And the idea is to, it, it, it pulls from all sorts of different things. So, um, you know, looking for things that are representative, appropriate and interesting, which is very vague. Um, so it works for me. Uh, so my study will have three phases. Uh, it started with an anonymous qualitative survey, which is now complete. Uh, I had 20 responses, which given everything going on in the world, I was actually happy with. Um, out of those responses, they were, it was, I think it was four or five questions, but they were open-ended. So they ended up with big chunks of text. Um, from there, I've, I've put it into a map and I'll show you what that map's looking like right now. So there's a collaborative mapping exercise. And then what I'm hoping is the people who participate in the collaborative mapping, that I'll pull them together for a, for a group interview to, to close off the work. So this is what the map looks like right now. Um, you know, it's done in Google Draw. Uh, there's been, it's a small group of people, you know, I'm hoping to get four or five people in there, but you can see just four or five people, the number of connections they've made between these things. Uh, and, and I love the fact that somebody's added color to the map that just happened, I think yesterday or the day before. Um, on the side of this map, what I didn't share, there's there's comments. So each of these lines, the people who've drawn the lines has put a comment, um, sort of explaining their their thinking behind it. I just didn't add them here because they, they have names attached to them. Um, so my next step will be to, <laughs> to find a way to make some sense of, of what they've put in here. Uh, to use photo, by, photo voice when conducting. We don't, we're, this is all, so it's all asynchronous. So we're not, I, I haven't talked to these people. They're, they just go in and they do it and then they comment and then they can reply to comments to each other. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of uh, asynchronous, asynchronicity. Uh, and so I think that's been an, like uh, sort of one of my, it's an experiment, but it's it's important to me. Like, 
you know, how do we get away from this idea that we have to be in the same spot at the same time and find a way that we can collaborate and maybe even have some fun, <laughs> you know, and, and, and maybe have more fun and, and more connection and more relationship than all sitting staring at each other on a Zoom call. Because, um, um, you know, I, 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 you know, having been at this for so long, like since before, man, I, we didn't, we certainly didn't have video chats when, you know, and I mean, we, we literally used a phone in the mail, right? Like, I think there's, we're, we've forgotten and, um, and we're, we're, you know, there, there's a lack of creativity be, because we, we just, we just default to this proxy face-to-face -face stuff. Uh, so in terms of that messy map, when I start to look at it and I start to think about these relationships of scale, the things that I'm starting to see are things like content, which I think of as open educational resources, uh, and the idea of broadcast versus co-creation. So that idea of something that we're pushing out to the world versus something that we're making together. Uh, I've been thinking increasingly about directionality. So typically, you know, dominant way of thinking, pushing that to the less dominant, previously previously excluded, global north, global south. Um, living in Canada, it's the, the south pushing things north. It's white people pushing it to non-white people. Like there's real directionality, even if when we look at textbooks, this stuff tends to move in one direction. So if we think smaller scale, is some of that about changing the direction of flow? Um, our processes, so in terms of open educational practices, I think for me, you know, as we think about scale, it's like control and consent. So how does changing the scale change our change how we are addressing issues of control and consent? In terms of audiences, accessibility, who are we reaching um, when we're working at different scales? And then tools and funding. Um, and I think for me, you know, it comes back to funding. Um, I mean, it also comes back to tools. I, both of those I think are huge. Um, and, and I think, again, we have to really think about um, what it means for the field that we A, use these big tools all the time or most of the time. And then what does it mean that the funding comes from foundations? Um, you know, in, in some, of the, some of the lit review that I did, it's like, it's amazing, you can just watch like, you know, whoever it is, Hewlett or, or Gates or whoever, their funding changes and the research changes. They are, you know, I, I think it's important at some point to say, what does it mean that foundations either implicitly or explicitly are driving our research agendas? And, and what does that mean for the field? What does it mean for us as people? What does it mean for our students? Um, like, you know, I, I think, I worry about it and actually the more I dug into it, the more I realized, um, the more concerned I became about um, about that relationship. You know, and I, you know, right now it's hard because I think it was Hewlett last week came out and said, oh, you know, now we're gonna do social justice and it's all about, uh, you know, diversity and social justice. And having looked at this history, on a certain level, I'm really worried about that. And, and it, like, I don't think it's a good thing and it's really hard for me to say, <laughs> oh, that's not good. Like, you know, let's be anti-social justice research. And, and that's obviously not what I'm saying, but I'm saying, you know, I, I think we have to think about what it means. And, and I think, you know, we'll see how it shakes out. Um, but if it follows those patterns, if we haven't learned from our mistakes, my prediction is that even though we're labeling it social justice, we're probably not gonna gonna get to where we're gonna where we we dream of getting, um, and and again it it comes back to the underpinnings of how and why we're doing things. So that's my that's that's what I have. So yeah, so we have a few minutes. So I don't know if you guys have questions or thoughts. Great, thank you, Tanya. That was really interesting. There's lots there to dig into. I'll just say thank you to the Hewlett Foundation for funding the go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I'll let, uh, I can give the mic to anybody, or you can just turn around the mic on, I think, um, or I can put uh, 
a question in the chat. I think it's interesting what you say, and I, I, I take your point about um, people always ask that question, uh, will it scale? It's like, and I think that's, you know, I have that a lot of the Open University because we deal with students with big numbers. Sometimes you just want to try something a bit different. And the first question anyone ever says is like, will it scale to 1,000 students, 10,000 students? Yeah. Well, does it matter if it doesn't? Not everything has to be for everybody. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. think so. so I wonder if there's that. Like so many things, I wonder if scale is a thing that's used to kind of just stop <laughs> stop asking to do awkward things. Kind of like you know, it's a bit. Oh, people often and people often use really good things. People often say like, "Oh, I'm worried about accessibility." What what they mean is like, I don't want to have to think about this. You know, it's like so people often use things. I think to kind of promote that. So I wondered if that if you'd come across any of that kind of sort of almost scale scale issues as a as a controlling factor. I think to kind of stop things yeah absolutely I, th I think i think that's part yeah it's scale is easy right and when i go back to the boots as i always do it's like yeah man it's hey if i need a pair of boots it's way easier to go buy them at the store than it is to sew a pair right like 100 percent, you know but what am i giving up in that and um what i didn't mention at the beginning is you know the, the biggest difference is structural around those two sets of boots is that if you're if you're living in a snowy place in gummocks, you can run really fast. And in boots, you clunk around. Literally, so my kids in the spring, when they put their boots back on, their actual like, you know, commercial boots, they had to learn to walk again because they'd been running, they'd been running in gummocks all winter. And then they changed back into their boots and they couldn't walk. And so I think, right, those technologies, those big scalable technologies, there's a trade-off there and, and it's clunky and it's awkward and it's, it's not fit to purpose usually. Um, and yeah, so, so I absolutely agree. I think we need to think about what are we giving up when we, when we use the easy, fast, don't have to think about it solutions. Uh, Does anybody want to come in with a, a question? Yeah, I dropped this in the chat, but why do they change back into their boots? Oh, good question. So, the, so gimmicks are made for dry snow. Um, they're on moose hide bottom, so when the snow starts to melt and and you and you have puddles, then you then you know there. I mean, there would be a tr traditional solution for that, but you know, at that point, we went to rubber boots for sure. <laughs> snow facts as well. You get um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to ask a question? Um, yeah, I was just thinking about the sort of. Uh, scaling up thing and um about boots as well maybe this was already implied and i missed it in your presentation but boots come in different kind of styles right some of them are mass produced economies of scale they're pumping them out off a production line somewhere but they also come as bespoke handmade italian leather or whatever um and i suppose the one doesn't cancel out the other right and a lot of the time to really stretch the sort of metaphor, the design of the spoke kind of stuff is then taken and mass produced somewhere else. You know, it's kind of the scalable bit is identified later. So just thinking about your comment, Martin, around, you know, why can't we just do this and see if it works? I think that's how I would kind of put the analogy together. You know, you, you do the test on the bespoke handmade thing to see if it can be produced at scale or you know, how many compromises you have to make to do it at scale or something like that. But even yeah, that implies... I, mean, I think that's one way to think about it. I think, you know, I, it, it, around that compromise, it's what's giving up. But I think to me, the other piece of that is the localization. The fact that the boot that were the gummock that works the best in, in the Northwest Territories will be different than the Italian version, right? And so it, it, I think there's a localization there that when we're always thinking about scaling, um, that we're going to lose every time. Every time you focus on scale, you're going to lose that that local, traditional, what makes it work best for its environment. And, and I think that, you know, I, I don't think it's an either or, but I think it's that, it's that tension. And that's that tension that, you know, I really am uh, digging into for sure. I would also say your analogy, Rob, suggests that everything should scale. Some things don't have to scale. Yeah. You know, they, work, they work well, they work better for... 10 people, but they won't work as well for you know, 10,000 people. Um, okay, 
I think we've got time at the end to bring all these things together. So uh, thank you for that, Tony. That was excellent. Thanks. Um, we enjoyed that. So uh, who's up? Is it? I think it's Kathy up next. Is it on the list? I should remember. Sure. I think so on the okay, list. Good. Have we got the slides there? Or do I need to add them? No, I need to add them. So I, I can look at me be. Yes. Oh, goodness. That seems so bright this early in the so morning. Are you, are you okay to drive, Kathy? Yes, I think so. Yes, I am. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am actually defending my dissertation in just a few hours. So I appreciate the chance to give this a dry run and uh, feel free to uh, ask me harder questions than I can expect to hear from my committee. Um, I would, I'd, I'd appreciate the chance to be nervous and, and, uh, yeah, kind of thrown off a little bit in a gentle kind of way. But um, so anyway, before uh, I dive in, well, the topic of my presentation is academic library publishing of open educational resources. And I shared some background um, last spring when I presented my proposal um, to kind of this, this group, uh, but I'm the open educational resources librarian at Oklahoma State University. And um, when I was hired, when I was brought on, we had a couple books in the publishing pipeline. And at that point, um, it was just kind of like, it wasn't really systematized, right? And we were, we were trying to figure out a way to, well, scale it to, extent, to an extent. But um, our scholarly communications librarian said, when are you gonna send this out for peer review and who are you gonna have peer review it? And it, it, was, a, it was a text that had been written by one of our uh, psychology professors. And I said, well, I don't, if, if, if we aren't confident in the work done by our own professors, I, I don't know why, what, who, who are we gonna send it to? Someone we think is smarter than our people, which I know is not what peer review is, but it kind of got me to thinking. And then I thought when he suggested some people, it was obviously, it was people that um, uh, had been, oh, they were well known and they were, they fit the mold, right? And at the same time, I was taking a critical feminist methodologies course and it read some work that was talking about um, who gets to ascribe knowledge, right? Who gets to decide what's truth? Who gets to decide what's right? And uh, also had read the uh, Made with Creative Commons book that talked about how you measure value in the commons as opposed to how you measure value in the capitalist market. And so this is all just kind of rolling around in my head and I wanted to explore it more. Um, and so I went to my committee and I said, I'd really like to wrestle with this. And one of my committee members is a philosopher and um, really neat guy and we're good friends. Um, we were, and we will be again today after five, but in the interim, uh, he said, I'd like for you to not question epistemologies in your dissertation. Um, and he was speaking of like black feminist epistemology and things. He said, those are hybrid epistemologies. And he said, I, he said, I just don't want to have to, he said, I just don't want to have to kind of go up against you on those in your dissertation. And I thought, you know, so I argued with him a little bit and then I kind of sat back and and uh, he and I visited some more and said, well, really, the first step is to figure out what is happening with academic library publishing of open educational resources. So that's what this is kind of a back way up foundational study to kind of lay the groundwork for then uh, the ability to ask some of these questions, you know, after you have the puffy hat and uh, yeah, philosophers. He's he's a great guy and, and is super fun to hang around with. And I'm glad he pushed me on that. I'm glad he made me look at that. And I do think it's made my work a little stronger. So uh, a lot stronger, probably, hopefully. So uh, anyway, this is just kind of a foundational look at academic library publishing um, of open educational resources. So, um, but I'd like to say thank you uh, before I move on to, to GeoGN. Um, this community of explorers has been a great source of support as I push through the final stages of my dissertation project through these last few months. Um, when I was too mentally and emotionally exhausted to persevere, I was able to borrow your curiosity and your optimism and your dedication to making the world a better place. And I want to thank Jennifer England for helping me uh, find GeoGN. Uh, I want to thank Deb Ba for her kindness and amazing energy. Uh, and mostly I want to extend my thanks to a group willing and able to offer meaningful mentorship and support. It's been significant, even probably in the operational research use of that word. Um, so academic libraries are among the institutions and organizations publishing open educational resources. Um, an academic library is a library intentionally aligned with a specific institution of higher education. This dissertation project investigated academic library publishing, publication 
of open educational resources. We know that academic libraries are publishing OER and leading initiatives related to OER, but we don't know much about what's happening in that space. We don't know what decisions are being made, for instance, about whether or not OER are sent out for review or if they're reviewed in-house. There is a possible conflation of open access and OER as OER are published through the scholarly communications house of the academic library. And a lot of time has been spent talking about OER in terms of licensing, access, and platforms, scaling, so to speak. Uh, but it's time for other conversations to be had as well. This study was specifically concerned with the ramification academic library publishing of OER has on the diffusion process of OER in higher education. And um, I don't have a slide in this dedicated formally to the theory, um, but this diffusion innovations theory was a theory that I used to kind of make sense of the data and uh, diffusion of innovations theory is describes uh, a communication network in which knowledge and experiences with an innovation are shared. And this particular theory defines innovation as an idea or a practice perceived as new to the individuals or organizations adopting it. And I think that definition of an innovation is, is important uh, to this study. But uh, this dissertation was accomplished as a qualitative case study research. Uh, qualitative case studies provide understanding and qualitative case study research was appropriate for these questions uh, because I saw answers to how, why, and what uh, relating to academic library publishing of OER. Uh, in addition, Rogers, uh, who's a DOI guy, the Diffusion of Innovations guy, recommended qualitative case study research for Diffusion of Innovation studies. So this single case study research project sought answers to questions of how, why, and what relating to academic library publishing of OER. I collected data through a review of public facing documents and via semi-structured participant interviews. Questions used to guide the semi-structured participant interviews were based on components of diffusion of innovations theory and were intended to serve as a means for the participants to share their perceptions regarding K-State library publishing programs. Uh, and Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas uh, was the unit of, of study. Uh, I'm at Oklahoma State. Kansas State is kind of a, it's a peer institution, just a little bit north of us, but we have uh, a lot, a lot in common. Um, so, uh, effective qualitative research, as you know, includes analysis of data concurrent with its collection. So I reflected throughout my interaction with each data source, be it the documents or the interviews, noting pieces of data which were responsive to my research questions and jotting notes capturing my hunches and thoughts regarding those pieces of data. I then, for each data source, wrote a memo uh, in which I reviewed and reflected upon my jottings and the pieces of data, considering them in the context of diffusion of innovations theory and using on what questions the data might answer and inform. For each data source, I then grouped the pieces of data together, open for any ways in which they might be in conversation with each other. The next step was to connect and make meaning of those groups through the lens of diffusion of innovations theory. These connected groups revealed patterns, which I then sorted into categories, I enacted the same process with each individual data source, putting the data in conversation with itself first, and then with the analysis associated with previous data sources. With each source, categories were expanded or subsumed as the meaning uh, of emerging patterns became clear. This analysis provided me with an understanding of the data through the lens of diffusion of innovations theory. To gain better understanding of my participants' impressions of K-State Library Publishing and to provide another layer of credibility to my work, I then reanalyzed the interview data using thematic analysis as outlined by Braun and Clark, uh, specifically the six-step analysis they outlined in their 2006 article. Um, and this six-step process is described in chapter three of my dissertation, which no doubt my entire committee will have read. Um, resulting themes were articulated. Oh crap, this is recorded. Okay, well, they won't watch it. Um, resulting themes were articulated as answers to the research questions posed by this dissertation study. So I need to get better at remembering things like that. So next, I want to highlight some findings from the study. They won't mind that I said that. Oh, you don't need to edit it back. It'll be good. Thank you. No worries. Um, but I will make sure I don't cuss. 
Um, so this study uh, found that provision of publishing platforms is integral to the K-State Library academic publishing programs. As shared uh, in chapter four of my dissertation, each of the participants responded to initial questions regarding how the library publishes by naming one of the publishing platforms. I was chuckling at Rob's comment in the, in the chat. The main platforms identified by participants were the New Prairie Press and the K-State Research Exchange, which is their institutional repository. Um, I don't know, that's, that's a meaningful phrase for librarians. The institutional repository is where you uh, would share out your preprints or other open access work. And the, the intent of an institutional repository generally is to um, increase the discoverability of the work of scholars at the institution. So um, the purpose of these platforms, well, I just said that. The nature of the online platforms is such that the work can be freely at no cost, access, shared, and in most cases, downloaded or otherwise retained by end users. Um, a second interesting finding has to do with the overlap between how the K-State Library publishes OER and non-OER academic material. This overlap is present for a number of reasons. Uh, and I also want to, I want to say it's also represented in the literature. This is a finding. I don't want to sound like this is singling out K-State at all. Um, very, this very much resonated with uh, what Anita Walsh had said and lots of librarians who are publishing in this space. So um, the overlap is present for a number of reasons. The first official instance of K-State Library publishing of OER came with a 2014 publication of an open access textbook on New Prairie Press. The publication of this textbook took place in the same way that other scholarly publications had been shared via New Prairie Press. The monograph was submitted as a completed work which had been externally created and reviewed. As interest in OER grew, uh, an implementation of an open and affordability textbook initiative grant at K-State increased the number of people creating OER. New Prairie Press continued to be the platform on which official or formal publication of OER took place. Until the recent late spring 2020 hiring of a new Skullcom OER librarian, the publication of OER was supported by the same people who, and physical in infrastructure as a publication of non-OER academic material. Open access publication and OER publication were seen as highly compatible and OER was published in the same way as the open access work. This matters for a couple of reasons. Work published on New Prairie Press is not easily adaptable or customized. New Prairie Press isn't the only place OER is published in formats difficult to customize and publishing it there does not make it not OER, but it does put it on a platform whose primary focus is global dissemination of completed scholarly work. A third finding I would like to highlight is that the K-State OER publishing program is entering a state of rapid change. With the spring 2020 hiring of the scholarly communications OER librarian, the library was able to create a position dedicated solely to the support of OER creation and publication. She's in the process of creating a publication workflow specific to OER and has been instrumental in the purchase of an institutional instance of Pressbooks uh, and has expressed concern with the ramifications of others perceiving overlap between open access and OER. Viewing this through the lens of diffusion of innovations theory helps provide understanding of the link between the hiring of the scholarly communications OER librarian and the rapid changes imminent in the K-State Library publication of OER. Rogers described organizations as a group of like-minded individuals working towards a common goal. As mentioned in chapter five, organizations with stable communication partners achieve these goals more efficiently, but a stable structure does not lend itself to innovative practices. And that comes from the diffusion of innovations theory. Uh, instability was forced onto the K-State library first by the 2018 Hale Library fire. And this is big news in the library world in, in the States anyway. Uh, they, they were fixing the roof and the roof caught fire and the library burned. Uh, in 2018. Uh, and they were just beginning to move back in this past year. Uh, they'd open up the first floor in the fall of 2019, but then COVID. So um, the instability was furthered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as the library reimagined itself, the scholarly communication OER librarian's position was created. Fac library faculty shifted to work from home because of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, two weeks after she was hired. And so she continued to be separated from routine organizational procedures, a situation in which, according to Diffusion of Innovations Theory, innovation is more likely to take place. So basically what we've seen is that 
this scholarly communications librarian came on board and everything was just in flux. And because of that, she has had space to create kind of some separate workflows and separate OER processes from open access processes. Um, and the, the theory really helps kind of illuminate uh, and bring meaning to, to how, that, how that came about. So where to go from here? Oh, okay, so uh, think I'll go ahead and answer. Martin, thank you for putting that in the chat. Defense type question. Did you get anyone else to do the categorization task too to see what the categories uh, same categories emerge. So yes, so kind of the external review that took place at this, first of all, I, I met with some researchers from GOGN uh, in a little session, kind of discussed thematic analysis to kind of review how I was gonna go about it and got some advice from them. And then I had uh, two other uh, members of GOGN look through my categories and themes and they kind of illuminated some questions. And then finally, another librarian who looked at the final categories and themes as they were defined, uh, and actually there were some interesting things that came out of that conversation. One of the specific findings in the dissertation itself uh, was that one of the reasons K-State Library publishes OER is because the values inherent in OER are similar to the land grant mission values of Kansas State University. And uh, when uh, the external reviewer, right, who, who was looking over the category said, this, I don't see this in the data as he was comparing it to the interviews. Um, I realized, well, you know what, that actually surfaced during a member check with that particular participant. And I did allow that then to color my interpretation of the data overall. Um, so that was definitely an instance where, uh, uh, yeah, it kind of elevated it, not really problematic, but certainly um, it would have been uh, in, in Further follow-up studies, I would maybe go back to that and invite them to speak to it, speak to it more. So yes, good, thank you. And they were very, very useful. Uh, Jennifer's asked, she said, I'm curious about the identification of a case study site as opposed to situating it at a major research university in the Midwest of the US or something similar. Good, Jennifer, thank you for asking that. Yes, and when, if this goes to press, that will be how we situate it. Yeah, just for the dissertation, uh, proposal and presentation, they did want me to go and speak to which specific university it is. Um, and Rob did identify any innovation adoption strategies that seem particularly effective and transferable. And more, uh, and that kind of goes to the, the future research that I'll cover here in a second. Um, but yeah, like as we're looking at that, that sounds kind of like a question where we're thinking we want to, we want to control, which isn't the right word, right? Predict and control. Um, so that wasn't necessarily one of the goals of this study so much as to um, kind of develop some understanding of what, why, and how. But I think this foundation can inform studies, Rob, that would then bring us to a place where we could identify some things that might control and predict. If I were gonna pull something specific out of this, I'd identify um, kind of how far away uh, the scholarly communications librarian is from the dean of the library because the farther down you are on the org chart, according to this theory, the more innovative you have room to be. And then also maybe just kind of leaning into some of the organizational flux that we're really all experiencing uh, and not uh, not panic. If there's kind of embrace the instability that's coming along with some of these changes and identify opportunities in there to be innovative. But that, that's a great question, Rob. Thank you for asking it. Um, so where to go from here? Um, so diffusion of innovations theory suggests that opinion leader organizations observable use of an innovation can meet trialability needs for organizations considering adoption of the innovation. Now, I didn't, again, I didn't go over the details of the theory and I'm afraid I'm already boring you, um, but I'm happy to talk about that because I, I do think that might be one of the most meaningful findings of this. Uh, a final question of interest uh, has to do with the impact of organizational structure of the diffusion of innovations at libraries. Uh, further, further future research could explore how in organizational instability and changes in communication networks resulting from unanticipated events impacts the diffusion of academic library publishing of OER. These answers will be of particular interest to academic libraries continuing to navigate challenges associated with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And I think it would also be worthwhile to do a comparative case study where we're looking at several different institutions in a way similar to the method I use in this study, the methodologies to see if this is reflected at other places. Uh, I know anecdotally from my own, this, this does resonate with ours. Uh, what does it look like at other places? Um, yeah, Tanya, I thought that was, I thought that was really interesting. 
makes it kind of depressing though. If I want to go knock on the door and get promoted, I'm like, uh, now then my job will get boring, uh, but maybe not. Um, so moving on to uh, limitations. So it's relevant to discuss or at least present the limitations to the study in relation to restrictions in place in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, much like you all are experiencing as a result of the then emerging COVID-19 pandemic. And I do have to say, I have a typo in my notes here that says COVID-20. Uh, so that was depressing. But OSU prohibited any out-of-state travel. Uh, and also the IRB, uh, our, our research compliance folks were saying no face-to-face -face gathering of uh, data. And most many academic libraries provided only distant services. And so kind of the, the short version is, uh, instead of going and being in context on the campus uh, and experiencing in real time, which is one of the strengths of the original study design, it ended up being, you know, uh, the virtual interviews uh, online and um, not getting to see, you know, faculty meetings and some of those other things that I hope to observe. One of the flip sides of that is that I did get to see the real life um, situation that they're working in, right? It was reflective of the actual context, but um, interviews on the physical campus might have yielded more contextual information and interactions taking place between the library faculty not also making their way through a global pandemic might have produced richer experiences specific to academic library publishing. Uh, we were talking about many other things as well. And also I found myself um, just very cautious, like we, as, a, as a feminist approach doing research with people, um, but just cognizant of their time and the cost of this to them as they were making their own way, uh, their own way through this. Um, they said, if you want to reach out to one of the faculty members, and I emailed the faculty member once, uh, and then found out he's school, school homing. That's not what's called homeschooling. Eight kids teaching tons of classes, and so some of those places where I would have pushed a little harder to get some response, um, I kind of, I really kind of didn't, uh, just to be considerate of the cost of this interaction uh, as, they're, as they're surviving emotionally and physically. So um, these are some of the resources uh, that informed the study design as well as the data collection and analysis. Uh, and of course, the whole list of resources I'm happy to share at another time. So um, thank you. And then I'll just show this last slide just because slides carnival templates, you know, to be authentic. So thank you. I'll browse back through the chat and happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Excellent, excellent run through okay. for your question this afternoon. Um, I, I think you've answered a lot of the um, uh, questions we've got along, but I'll, I'll open the floor if everyone else wants to ask a, a question. Um, I, th I thought those lessons you were sharing at the end about kind of how you had to adapt during the pandemic were really interesting. That should be good to kind of collect those together, I think. I mean, just, Thank you. It was a very stressful time, but I think at that point you make is that often the people you want to speak to <laughs> are exactly mm -hmm. the people who are the most inf impacted by all this stuff that's going on. And you don't want to be the other thing that you're sort of piling on top of them. You know, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. And I presented the proposal, I defended the proposal on March 13th, which was our last day to have our physical campus open before we went home. So it's been, it, it, it's been an interesting ride, just as it has, just as it has for everyone else. Um, I noticed, okay, so Sarah, you mentioned Jen. I'm going to cough, I'm sorry. <coughs> um, so a heads up, one of the things I ran into with my proposal, I very much structured it using Yin. And then um, I think I talked about doing the analysis with Glesney and just kind of a nod to Miriam and Tisdale. And one of my committee members, not the philosopher, but another one pushed back against that and said that Yin is very quantitative and mm. sort of part quantitative stuff and then say, I'm going to use this qualitative analysis. Hmm. Um, yeah. She said, make sure you're able to really pull those all together. Yeah. So that's just that's a really I, good point. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. Cause the, the last time um, I relied on you and it was for um, like a rhetorical analysis, which was a bit more quantitative and I didn't even kind of put that together. So thank you. I, I like the things that Ian says about um, how to, I think he does like the crosswalk method. And I felt mm -hmm. like as I designed my study with a nod to Yin, um, I was able to, because he articulates it so clearly. So as far as, yeah. as far as credibility and rigor and all that, and all of that, but yeah, then when I, I had to make a more smooth, a more smooth, that was not, those were not good words, a smoother transition from why I built it using Yin, but then analyzed it using uh, Miriam and Tisdale. Thank you. 
uh, just in the, I'm going to read out the questions because we're not recording the chat. So Marion asks, uh, when do you hope to start the follow-up studies? She's really curious about the outcomes. Oh man, I am so excited. And I hope to start them at 5, 10 this afternoon. Um, that's one of the things I, I just can't, I'm, this has been delightful and wonderful and I enjoy it. And I think it was a good first step, but I, yeah, I can't wait to start the next steps. Yeah. So right, right away. Mm -hmm. That's what we like to hear. You haven't been burnt out and frazzled by the whole process that you know you never want to go near it again. So that's a good result. So that's good. Right. Well, and the timing of like these OER conference series season, like you guys are saying, is good too because it's gotten me it's gotten me back excited about it. So if there had been any OER fatigue, it's it's gone. Listening to the work y'all are sharing. Cool. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and uh, good luck this afternoon. I'm going to uh, just load up Sarah's. Uh, well, now I think we might have a bit of time at the end, but I want to make sure we give Sarah enough time to do her presentation. So thank you, Kathy. And uh, over to you, Sarah. Can you see the, the arrows at the bottom to do the driving? I can, thank you. Sorry, there's a little bit of a, a lag in unmuting myself. Um, and that's okay. I can keep my talking points brief. I have to admit to you, I am pretty... So for those of you who are in the room earlier today, I was explaining how, um, you know, the homeschooling and the young kids and full-time job and all of that is really taking its toll, especially during conference season. Um, I think this is my fourth presentation in the past couple of weeks um, on open and it's, whew, I'm feeling it. Um, so good afternoon, good morning. Um, I'm gonna be rounding out this second session here. Um, I really like the kind of the, the setup between Tanya and Kathy and like where you are in your research. Um, you know, Kathy, you're in the home stretch and about to finish up. And um, I really, I really liked how you framed the disruption that we're all experiencing right now. Um, what I'm gonna be talking about is somewhere kind of in between where it's like, I feel like I'm just in the, the beginning of establishing like the philosophical underpinnings for my dissertation work, but it is a continuation of previous research that I've done. So it's kind of like stringing it together and it's, um, so I think it's a, a nice end cap. Um, this picture that I have here, I took uh, the week of the election. I thought it was kind of poignant for the, the long road ahead that we're facing. Um, you know, whether it's political context or educational context. So, let me move this around here. Here we go. So first of all, um, you know, I, I do really want to thank the, the Global OER Graduate Network for providing this opportunity for all of us. As Kathy was saying, um, you know, it it's a, a really wonderful network of support. And I'm I'm still incredibly new to the network, so I'm I don't really know so many folks yet. Um, but I've, you know, from everybody I've interacted with thus far, they've been wildly supportive. Um, you know, and I and I have a lot of gratitude too for the, um, you know, the coincidental collisions I've had at conferences um, where that, that that's what led me to this is that, you know, I bumped into someone from Nelson Mandela University at OE Global last year and they're like, hey, you should go talk to this guy, Rob Farrow. And I was like, okay, um, and here we are. <laughs> So I'm very appreciative for, you know, those relationships and taking the time um, to to be able to to make that space um, to meet people. And so I also, in that spirit, want to you know give appreciation for the the work upon which I'm building. You know, we're talking about um, open education, open publishing, and you know there are many people who have preceded me. Um, in this research, and I have colleagues that I've that I've conducted studies with. Um, you know, there's stunning visuals that uh, we all use as a part of our work, and I'm appreciative for all of that. So, to provide a little bit more um, about my my position, positionality, I guess the lens I look through. I hang out with a lot of anthropologists, so I would start with the lens. Um, so. As a librarian and a first-gen college student, um, first and family PhD, I'm really passionate, always have been about providing access to information and education, providing opportunities for that student agency and that voice, um, particularly to those who haven't had the educational scaffolding 
<laughs> um, and are kind of navigating their way along and kind of struggling to figure out like, where do I fit in this picture? Where's my autonomy? Um, how can I contribute here? And there's a lot of inequities um, in that as, as we all are, are well aware. Um, and so to give a little more context, additional context to you about where I'm coming from, um, so far as you know where I work, I'm I'm at UMass Amherst. Um, I do serve I serve as a librarian there. I'm the head of a department that uh, focuses on student success and engagement. Um, however, you know a lot of what you'll be hearing me talk about here in creative scholarship is related to multimedia production and digital media. Um, and uh, in the spaces that I oversee, I oversee a digital media lab that engages in. Um, you know, video, audio, virtual reality, production, augmented reality, um, 3D printing, all, all of that stuff. And so um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, um, a big part of it that needs to be um, kept, in, kept in mind is, you know, when um, Tani was talking about, you know, large versus small scale, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is small scale, very bespoke. Um, and there is a recognition I want to put out there first and foremost that these resources I recognize are not available to everybody who wants to engage in a similar type of action research um, and study. And so a little bit more about UMass here. You know, we are a Carnegie R1 classified institution at very high level of research activity. I feel like this is important to note, um, not only because we're very well resourced in that regard, but because there's also you know, more heavily weighted uh, emphasis on research than teaching sometimes, frequently, a lot. This is being recorded, okay, I'm gonna stop. Uh, <laughs> so what I'll be covering today specifically, um, you know, and digging in and I, you know, I, I, thought, I thought about using the iceberg image as well because it's like, it's just, you know, I'm just at the tip of the iceberg right now. Um, I'm gonna be looking at how I, you know, I came upon my original concept for my research and the, the journey that I, that I followed to get there and then exploring the literature in the field. Of course, as a librarian, when you consider a literature review, it can be um, a lifetime, <laughs> a lifetime process. And so, you know, kind of reining that in. Um, and then, you know, the reasoning for choosing my methods based on previous uh, original research that I've done as a part of my, you know, regular work and, and position. Um, as well as my doctoral work. And then my plans for data collection and analysis and then next steps um, for that dissemination. So when, huh, what do you, what, what would you think librarians think about? <laughs> okay, so we are. I mean, Kathy covered a lot of this. I heard you saying the same things about like, you know, platform interoperability and you know, licensing and a lot of that. I mean, we have been talking about open publishing for I, a very, very long time. Um, but we think about it, we've thought about it for a very long time, um, looking at access to the content, you know, navigating the licensing of, of open access content, um, you know, the, the persistence of digitally born content and, you know, whether or not it's owned or leased, um, if it's still gonna be there, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, you know, and then, in thinking about how to get faculty to engage in publishing openly, you know, a lot of that conversation is surrounding the, the quality of open ed and the peer review process as a part of open access publishing. Um, and then of course the discoverability, always the discoverability. And that's why we're so obsessed with metadata and um, what these larger aggregators are doing to help us discover um, open courseware, open textbooks and, and whatnot. And so there's definitely, um, you know, a recognition that there's been, that open has become a major disruptor to traditional publishing because a lot of these larger, um, you know, commercial conglomerate publishers like Cengage and ugh, Pearson um, have rolled out their faux ER projects in about the last year or so. They're false open educational resources, promises made by these large publishers while still maintaining that exorbitant cost for access, maintaining those paywalls. Um, so if you really wanna bake a librarian's potato, just start talking about Pearson. Whew. Another way that um, librarians have been thinking about OER from that educational access perspective is you know, putting students at the center 
Um, and, you know, looking at textbook cost, because that's the most concrete and approachable form of OER to start that conversation with faculty. Um, you know, again, drawing from that, in, that inf ever inflating pricing in the scholarly publishing industry, this study from 2012 shows how dramatically the textbook costs have been rising in the US um, over time. And so, you know, again, looking at that and the, the, the sheer percentage of costs for educational access that textbooks are, you know, required readings provide. This is something libraries have been thinking about for years. How do we provide that information to access? And so I've been deeply steeped in that for well over a decade now, uh, more in the scholarly publishing realm, access to information realm. And then I really started thinking about what else? What else? Um, you know, what is there beyond the affordability conversation? What are the benefits beyond, um, you know, providing access, which is incredibly important. It is all very incredibly important work, but the, the more research I did, the more partnering that I did, um, you know, over time, I noticed that there was a much greater benefit to, um, you know, student use of and co-creation of OER, um, you know, beyond that access. And, um, there, I also noticed that there, while there is an, an increasing number of studies being conducted on the adoption and the perception of quality of OER, there was very limited research in the area of student perception and self-efficacy when they were engaging in the co-creation or self-authorship of OER. A lot of these conversations about persistence are more within the realm of, you know, uh, students would be dropping classes if they couldn't afford materials. Um, they would avoid, you know, the a lot of the, um, you know, the hallmarks of their of their majors and whatnot. And like, that's what it was looked at for impacting persistence, um, but not the engagement factor. And so that's where I really started looking at, like what I was, I was very interested in researching, which is there's this big gap in perception studies. And I, um, for a long time, have been, you know, qualitative data analyst and a lot of um, ethnography um, and really, you know, I've been attracted to that, that rich um, descriptive narrative and personal stories. And so I started getting really excited about the possibilities. And this was only at the end of last year. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, I want to like change this. Um, so uh, one of the things that helped me kind of ramp up to, you know, take a, take a look at shifting um, my dissertation, really, was a previous study that um, I had conducted back at the end of 2018. Um, this was a study I conducted with colleagues looking at an honors course where students are creating podcasts for their final assignment as opposed to written papers. Um, that's another thing too um, of note that as, um, as an artist and you know, I, I do write a lot, but um, I'm all about creative expression of scholarship and, and how, um, that type of personality of voice can be um, infused um, using different mediums. And so um, a part of the assignment was to publish these podcasts openly in an institutional repository. Uh, working with that course instructor and another colleague, we designed a platform for publishing, um, integrated an instruction on Creative Commons licensing and media production into the course. And I formulated a survey measuring self-efficacy and confidence levels in students as they experience this new open educational practice model. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So this is just, I'm going to refer back to this later. This is just an example. Um, and like I had said, when Kathy was presenting, uh, um, thank you for defining institutional repository because this is a snapshot of ours, digital commons. I'm sure you recognize the layout. Well, uh, well, actually, this is not. This is SoundCloud. This is before we moved it over to the IR. Sorry about that. A little, a little sleepy. Um, and so in this previous study I conducted, you know, I talked to these students a lot about what it meant to engage in the scholarly process, what it meant to share their work, you know, putting it out there, having it be visible, having their, you know, voice be heard, and, and then not having control over, you know, what people thought about it, and then talk to them about how that made them feel, um, how it impacted how much more engaged they were in the learning process, because they're like, I really need to know this stuff well, if I'm going to produce this thing, and everyone's going to see it, um, and so it was, you know, looking at those motivational factors beyond like, I need to do this because I need a grade, I need a credit, I need this, I need that. It was really about like, I'm beholden now to um, this peer network of scholars. I'm a scholar. Um, 
So were students required to, yes, yes, they were. Jennifer, sorry, I haven't um, been keeping up on that. Yeah, um, yes, they were. And and we also, I mean, that was a part of the, um, the additional educational component that uh, the action research part of this other course is that, you know, we walk them through the same process we were with the faculty about like, this is what it means to CC license your work. Um, and, you know, this is what it means as your, you know, for your rights as an author and, and also teaching them about how an institutional repository works and how they can upload their own content and have that additional autonomy. Uh, so, <clears throat> this is just a little like snapshot of that. Um, you know, this was just a part of this, you know, this mixed um, quant and, and qualitative survey. Um, and this was from the, I wanna say pulled from the CATME 5, the self-efficacy score. Um, it's just a, a sample of the questions. There was that quantitative component of the survey here. Um, but then there were also complementary qualitative questions that focus more on motivation for completion of coursework, their comfort levels with an understanding of Creative Commons licensing um, after having to publish their work as such, and um, their understanding of what publishing openly really means. And so that resulting data was really encouraging, which led me to want to conduct an, a more in-depth case study with a class of non-honor students. I feel like it's really important to to make that different differentiation here. There's a lot of um, discussion about um, autodidact, autodidactic um, learners and you know, working with folks who are really motivated intrinsically um, that, and they end up being like honor students and some of the, you know, the graduate students and whatnot, but I'm very interested in uh, intrinsic motivation for just a student, like not a, you know, a, a high performer, not a, I know exactly what I want to be when I grow up. Um, it's just, I'm moving through this. I'm moving through this right now. And what is going to motivate me to complete it? So um, it was really important to me to uh, continue this research with a non-honors course. And so getting situated in the field, um, <laughs> you know, there's a, uh, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, <laughs> Yes, Martin, that's absolutely true. I mean, that not to, hey, I'm not, you know, um, I don't want to uh, trash talk any of them. Um, but yeah, they're not, they're not that interesting. They're kind of like a self-driving car. Um, so, so I was, you know, even though there is a great amount of really amazing research and literature out there, I still seeing that gap. Um, many of the case studies were from a practitioner's perspective. And while incredibly useful for scaling and adoption, there's still limited research beyond accessibility and quality when looking specifically at textbooks or co-creation of course materials, which is what I was look at, really looking to for these, um, you know, these student artifacts of creative work. And so uh, why, why did I go with a phenomenological case study? Um, I've done case studies before, um, you know, and I really wanted to do this deep dive. Um, the case study I've done previously, and you know, thank you again, Kathy, for bringing that up um, with Yin, because um, I'd done more of a rhetorical analysis and looking at the the proliferation of the term innovation in higher ed policy. <laughs> so we talk a lot about this goes back to um, I think something uh, that Tanya was saying earlier too about you know the trends and focus of funding and development depending on what is popular in the discourse. I've made that a point of research in the past. And it's, gosh, I was glad to be done with that. Um, because it's really, it, it gives you that same sort of um, nervous and kind of like sick feeling about like, are the winds going to shift this way or that way? Like, this can't be a fad. Um, just wanted to drop that comment right there, because I've been thinking about it ever since um, your presentation. So I was familiar with the construct of case study. Um, I was really looking for a way to create, like I said, that thick, rich narrative with the student voices. Um, and given that my interest is also in self-determination theory, C, uh, sorry, C, S, D, T, um, phenolo phenomenology is a good fit since it looks at that personal perspective and how individuals navigate their, their world through the lens of these self-constructed um, identities. And so, do, 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 do. So in my research questions, um, 
you know, for for this, you know, growing growing the scope for my previous research, these are the current questions I developed to take a closer look at student motivation and engagement. And really what I want to know when looking at this specific OEP model, um, you know, what gets them hooked? Where are the hurdles, especially when it comes to technology anxiety, which is huge in media production, but now also has like great applicability to the remote learning environment and engaging in, um, you know, using new tools for uh, community formation. Um, you know, looking at what the hurdles are for engagement in that course content and that scholarly production, you know, why do they care? And what does it really mean for the, the future practice in open ed in general? Like why, why do learners care? Because that's what this is all about. It's not about how big or small or awesome we can do anything. It's like, what's the real benefit? Um, so, so this is just a sample of my interview questions. Um, these are semi-structured interviews. Um, you know, this is a distillation from the original research questions um, and their focus is on pre-existing awareness and understanding of open and open educational resources, but also the exploration into how this understanding impacts their confidence and how they feel. Like I was saying earlier, like these students, when they understand that, oh, my work is out there, I'm a scholar, I'm being recognized for this, like how, how does that make them feel? Um, does it make them feel more confident in their knowledge base um, and how critically they have engaged in the course content? Um, or does this you know, totally freak them out. Um, so looking at conducting the research, um, oh, I'm also keeping my eye on the time here. This is kind of the workflow, um, you know, that process for conducting research because it's, um, you know, phenomenology follows, a, you know, a group through a shared experience and I wanna make sure to gather as much data as possible at three different points. Um, throughout the course of the semester with these in-depth interviews, um, beginning, middle, and end, it's gonna be a lot of data. Um, then looking at a grounded theory um, to, you know, which I will admit when I was first introduced to it, um, it freaked me out as a librarian because it seems so messy. <laughs> it's like, you want me to fill the buckets and then empty them out? What are you talking about? That's crazy. Um, but now I love it and I'm using it. Um, and then again, for the course crate, so I wanted to select a course for this case study, um, again, non-honors. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I wanted to have third to fourth year of study students and the creative, um, the scholarly output had to be something creative, um, which I have a, you know, definition for that in my research. <laughs> yes, and now I love, you know, I've gotten so messy over the years. I. Pff, as a researcher, researcher, it's wild. I love it. <laughs> Before I, you know, when I first years ago, I was like, I'm going to be a statistician because I'm actually like a, a whiz with the maths and I've always really liked statistics. And now I'm doing grounded theory. What, what happened? <laughs> I love it. Clearly I was a little too uptight. Um, so in that course partnership, I have a link in the slides here to um, an open syllabus that I have co-developed with um, an instructor in linguistics. It's writing for linguistics. Um, and the these are the four primary goals of that. And it really is um, one of the things that attracted me to this course is in addition to it being creative scholarship, it was um, that communication of, of research and theory to the public and lay audiences, which I'm all about. Um, and so I invite you to explore that syllabus at your leisure. It's hosted in Google Drive. Um, and so this is just an outline of the course that I'm partnering with for this case study. Um, and, you know, it kind of shows you the, progr the progression of how the students move through, um, you know, that engagement with content and then the final production of their videos in order to, to educate the, the populace on um, linguistics theory. And then this is a little bit more about that final video assignment, um, which just describes, you know, the process that they go through. Um, and, I, and I really like the focus on the, the questions here where it's like, what are you really looking to communicate and why is this concept important to a general audience? And I feel like for this, these are questions we have in our own research. Um, and that is another one of the, the big reasons why I was attracted to partnering with this particular course. Um, 
I'll make sure I don't go too far over time. So again, what a year. So this course wasn't taught this fall. Um, so I haven't actually been able to collect any data yet. It's really just been about, you know, moving forward with partnering with the instructor, being able to collaboratively develop this syllabus. Thanks. Thanks a lot, COVID. But um, it's really looking at the, the positive outcome of all of this. Um, interruptions aren't always a bad thing. It gives you time to slow down, build these relationships, think very critically about what your goals are in your research, um, deepen those collaborations. And it really is reflective of the type of research that I'm doing is creating that rich narrative. And in addition, I've been able to integrate a new facet to this phenomenon that students are all moving through because they're moving through it um, in a pandemic, they'll still be engaging in remote learning. There are a lot of implications for online and blended learning um, through this bespoke process. And this semester, I've been teaching a graduate course um, on makerspaces and leadership remotely, which was always very tactile and in person. And like I'm pulling so much from that and in, in engaging with my students on like, this is how they're learning in this new environment. And then applying to how I'm going to be talking with these students in linguistics in the spring. So it's all good. It's all good stuff. Um, okay. I think that's my that's my bit. Um, thank you so much for your time, your attention. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm going to read out some of the questions in the chat so that you can give a chance to answer it. So. Uh, Marin asked, did students have the choice to publish open or not? Do, I'm sorry, do the students have a choice the, to publish? Yeah. Yes, they do. Okay. They do, uh, it's an, an opt-in. Cool. Uh, and Jennifer says, did the responses to the second question touch requirement of CC licenses, requirement to CC license their work and publish their work in specific ways, places? Yes, I think I think that I I saw that one midstream, and they yes they are required to to publish CC, and it and in the in the um as a part of their their course you know they are introduced to the the many different flavors of CC licensing and um, what options and the, there's never a, any pressure to go in one direction or the other. Cool. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Oh. I'll leave space for someone to spit in the chat or open up a microphone. Um, I thought your, well, everyone's thinking, but I thought your journey was very interesting, Sarah, from the kind of like, <laughs> as you say, like from the kind of analytics, statistical world and looking at the kind of the things you can quantify, like yeah. cost savings and those kind of things and yeah. moving to much, to looking at a lot of the kind of more, I guess emotional aspects about how, pe how people feel about these things as well. Yeah. That's a kind of uh, an interesting journey. And I, I'm not belittling the kind of cost saving stuff. I think there's been lots of good work done in that area, you know, by yeah. people yeah. like you know, David Wiley. And, but, um, but I think it's interesting, that, you know, I think it's almost like we've done that bit of work. It's kind of an ad to move on to the kind of the next stage yeah. of life. Yeah. What you might call the more interesting questions, I think. <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I think it's good to have that kind of room in there for that. We often don't talk about, you know, how does it make you feel to have this kind of stuff happen? I think that's kind of really mm -hmm. an angle to explore. Uh, I see Rob's got his microphone on, so I'll shut up and let Rob talk. I was just going to make a comment um, really along similar lines. Um, on your last slide, you said something like, like delays or interruptions aren't necessarily a bad thing or things kind of not going the way that you first thought it would. Mm -hmm. They're really a bad thing. Um, and I couldn't agree with that more. I think uh, I, I don't want to over categorize people, right? But some, some PhD or EdD students have a very clear idea at the start of what they're doing and mm -hmm. they do it, right? Because they've already sort of set it all out in advance and they just mm -hmm. kind of follow the plan and there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Um, but it doesn't leave much room for a sort of breakthrough moment. Um, yeah. You've sort of already decided I'm going to follow this method and I'm going to collect my data in this way and, and that kind of thing. And I think a lot of the time, the more interesting bits of research are the curveballs and the mm -hmm. and the cock-ups and when things don't go quite as they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden then you're thrown into a more kind of 
uh, a sort of richer intellectual and reflective space, I think, because then you have to kind of think again, what, what am I doing? I, mm -hmm. I can't just follow this sort of uh, prescribed idea of what I'm supposed to do as a researcher. Um, I've got to kind of build it from the ground again, almost. And I think, mm -hmm. I think it's helpful for research to kind of almost have that kind of um, beginner's mindset permanently, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To always be sort of aware that you have to kind of reorientate what you're doing and re-justify what you're doing on an ongoing basis, right? Because if all you're doing is kind of mechanically following uh, a rubric about mm -hmm. this is how you do a survey, this is how you analyze the data, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. And we need standards and stuff like that. But hey. it's often when things go wrong that you actually start thinking properly again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the following the that prescriptive um you know data collection analytic process that's what i do in my day job you know <laughs> then that's all well and good and we absolutely need to do that and a big part of you know having gotten involved in higher education research um, and policy research for the past several years i've recognized the necessity for uh, you know we're beholden to certain funding bodies there are all of these metrics that you need to follow in order to keep the resources for that bespoke, important, essential work um, going. And um, and I think that they can be complementary to one another. Um, and, and I also love seeing when um, things do break and it isn't enough. And we get trapped in these places of like, okay, where are the stories? And that's that's one of the biggest um, takeaways from from this year where I'm at now, where everybody's really interested in the stories because the um, that entire you know quantitative data gathering process has been entirely derailed because things are so irregular so far as how classes are being taught, um, how people are coming onto campus, and, and and all of that. And so that's where these narratives can really come in to help be the big connector. Um, between these, I guess, quantitative outposts, as it were. I think it, go, it kind of connects with the previous discussions around scaling and people yes. wanting to see numbers that prove it scales. And that's the thing yep. that matters. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the only sort of valid currency is numbers when you get to a certain sort of scale, scaling point. No one really cares about the individual experiences. They want to know, okay, what, are the, what story do the numbers tell? But one mm -hmm. thing that we We've been sort of, um, you know, thinking about how you communicate research outputs to different people and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What seems to be most effective is having having numbers to back it up, but the right. narrative the, na the narrative is the powerful thing a lot of the time. Exactly. And sort of bringing those two things together in the right way can be really effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's what makes it relatable. Just we've got about five minutes left. I just wondered if uh, now that. They've all seen each other's presentations. If Tanya, Kathy, or Sarah had any um, sort of points, they saw of similarities or synergies between their their work and what's going on at the moment. Rob mentioned one about scale but Not to put you on the spot, you don't have to see them. I just wanted to, I'd get I'd give you the opportunity to say it at the end. Of the day. Certainly, I mean, you know, I, and we've been talking about it already, but you know that that certainly my journey has gone from from looking at really learning analytics in its baby days uh, to, to doing something very, very different. And, um, you know, Sarah, it's so interesting that I feel like you're on a similar path. Um, and, and I, you know, yeah, I think it's about more than just telling the stories for me, it's that space for thinking differently about things. And I saw that in both of your works as well, which is like, you know, there's measuring against the standards that exist, which is fine, but that's going to keep us on the same path that we're on now, which God, I hope we don't stay on. Right. So, so how do we rethink what we're doing? No kidding. <laughs> path, right. And, and, you know, your work, both of your work, I, I, I saw that same thinking in of, you know, moving towards not just repeating, but, you know, what, a different direction looks like. So I think that's awesome. I agree. It's definitely a body of work and it was neat to see how they all kind of click together. Yeah. So we planned it. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank all three presenters today. That was uh, really interesting. Um, and thank you very much for a round of applause to all three of you. I bet there were some really interesting topics there. So thanks, everyone.
I'll let you go. And I guess last thing we'll say is just to wish Kathy very good luck. And I'm sure you'll smash it out of the park, Kathy. And let us know how you get on. I will. I will. Thank you so much. Cheers.